Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to revisit the classic album from 1973, Dark Side of the Moon, from Pink Floyd. But before I do that, just a couple of updates here, what's coming up. Uh, I did post my conversation with Andrew Brooks on Brainwashed, which is on his channel, Andrew B. Um, the May Pang discussion I did with Colin Pike is on Colin's channel, Beatles Words of Wisdom. That was last week, and tomorrow we've got a discussion with Nancy Andrews, which I'm hoping we're going to be able to publish on, on our channels as well. So I'll send you details of that or look out for that. Uh, the conversation is tomorrow, so expect that to be posted sometime soon after that. So that's what's coming up. Anyway, what prompted this reappraisal of Dark Side of the Moon? Well, I suppose it was in part this uh, redux project of Roger Waters, where he's re-examined re the album and reinterpreted it. And I uh, didn't buy it, and I've listened to it once or twice um, on Spotify, and I'm not overly impressed. He, he's perfectly within his rights to do it, of course. Um, but to me, the album that he's come up with now, the reinterpretation, um, is a little bit self-indulgent and also misses all of the musical, well, most of the musical magic that was on the original. Uh, obviously, it misses Rick Wright's keyboard work, Dave Gilmore's guitar work and Nick Mason's drumming. And Roger's vocals are more of a kind of gravelly, growl, Leonard Cohen type style vocal than back in the day. Obviously, back in the day, Dave Gilmore was singing the lead more often than not. But um, I thought it was an interesting project and the, the audience at the Palladium was presumably, presumably delighted by it the other night with a, with a few exceptions I read, but um, I wasn't prepared to pay that kind of money to, to watch that and I'm not going to buy the album either. But anyway, I will go, so that prompted me to go back and listen to the original album and of course, surprise, surprise, I know Roger doesn't want to compare the, the original to the new one he's done, but obviously everyone is, is bound to do that. And uh, when one goes back to the original, one is just struck by the majesty of it and also how perhaps one has taken it for granted over the years because everyone's sort of going on about it all the time. And so you tend to stick, out for some, stick up for some of the other albums which get less exposure. But when you come back to this one, it is a masterpiece in many ways and it sort of flows very nicely as a concept uh, the lyrics are perhaps Roger's breakthrough as a lyricist. He'd done some good lyrics before this album, but uh, I think this was his first great set of lyrics. And although if push comes to shove, I would say he went on to do better sets of lyrics on animals and the wall, um, that there's, nothing, there's nothing to complain about here lyrically. They're very, it's a very philosophical package dealing with um, sort of human life, you know, and loss and uh, death and mel mental illness and the, par the passing of time and greed, you know, that's sort of familiar subjects for Roger Waters' lyric writing, but um, th this was the first time he'd really sort of come up with a sort of major statement and the, all of the band loved it and they worked very harmoniously on this project, all four of them interjecting ideas and there was no hierarchy within the band. You know, if one of them had an idea that they would, uh, they would all work on it if it was the best idea and there was no sort of dominant force like Roger later on became a bit dominant in the band. But here, no sign of it and um, to the album's benefit because you've really got a collaborative effort. Um, Dave Gilmore's on record saying he thinks the success of this album is due to the, the um, combination of the lyrics uh, and the music and the packaging. And this packaging is by hypnosis. And uh, they did the back cover as well and also the, the gatefold. And uh, I was reading their book, hypnosis book on album sleeves and this rainbow line sort of extends from the front cover on, onto the through to the inner sleeve and then onto the back cover. So if you were a record shop owner back in the day, you could do a pretty, pretty deep, neat display showing the, the front cover and then the gatefold and then the back cover sort of showing the full extent of this rainbow and the, you've got the heartbeats here um, which are quite interesting and the lyrics printed on the album I think I'm right in saying was it the first time Pink Floyd had printed their lyrics I think I think I'm right in saying it was and they would not do that 
on, did they do that on Wish You Were Here? I can't quite remember, I don't think they did, but on Animals they did, and on The Wall they did, and on the final cut they did, even though the typeface was so small you couldn't read it. But um, anyway, um, so the packaging is great. It comes with two posters, no less. It comes with two stickers as well, which I rather foolishly stuck onto the gatefold here, so this album is not in mint condition. But what was interesting about the posters, I mean, there's one band poster which is um, which you're all familiar with, um, but I was looking on Discogs, and there is a kind of alternative version of this poster which is in portrait as opposed to landscape with slightly different pictures of the band, so I thought that was interesting, and I'm not sure how many copies went out with my version versus the other version, and also the pyramids, because I was looking at the new vinyl, and it was three big pyramids with a, with a purple sky in the background, and then I looked on my original album, and I've got a completely different poster. I've got three green, small green pyramids. Um, I looked it up on Discogs, doesn't seem to be that rare, but I thought it was interesting again. Maybe there are other variations. If you know of any other variations, leave them in the comments. Um, because I found that quite interesting. And also in the CD thing, which came out in the, the box set uh, recently, the the pyramids are blue with a blue sky as opposed to a purple sky. So a slight difference there, but pretty similar to the new vinyl packaging. And I like the way the, the CD has all the, the goodies inside it, including the miniature stickers um, and the two posters. So just quickly show you the miniature stickers if I can get them out. Yeah, here they are, <laughs> pretty small. Uh, anyway, I like the, like the fact they, they did that. Um, and they did that with Wish You Were Here. You get the full packaging there with the black plastic bag on the CD as well. So anyway, nice packaging. Um, must have been a very alluring sort of front cover. You go into the record shop and luckily it did have a sticker saying it was Pink Floyd, otherwise you wouldn't know it was Pink Floyd. They'd all already tried that with Atom Heart Mother. They just put a picture of a cow on the front with no band name, but it pretty effortlessly got to number one, that album. So it wasn't unheard of not to have the name of the band, but they did actually choose to put a sticker on here so you wouldn't know who, who you were getting. And apparently Hypnosis submitted five or six ideas for the cover and you would have you would think um, an album called Dark Side of the Moon you might just have a sort of slightly half-lit picture of the moon um, but no Pink Floyd went for this quite a manager when Hypnosis presented the six options all four members of the band chose the prism said that's the one all in agreement it's pretty nice to see Pink Floyd all in agreement because as we know it didn't happen always in later years. Uh, this is very rare for them to release a single, um, but it was a single in most countries. And I think there was a second single off the album. Anyway, it probably helped the sales of the mothership. And this is my new vinyl version, which I've still got in the shrink wrap, although I did open it for the record. But it's I, my son's copy, he took the shrink wrap off and the texture of the album is very nice, kind of velvety texture which I thought was interesting but I didn't want to open mine and get finger marks all over it so anyway again this comes with all the goodies and and reasonably priced the Pink Floyd uh, albums the new vinyl compared to some other bands or artists who charge you know 30 or 35 quid for a new album uh, you can pick up the, the Dark Side of the Moon uh, for less than 20 quid even now I think so that's good um, as I say covering multiple sort of topics on the album I think if you take the lyrics on their own without the music, I was reading them the other day and listening to Roger's Redux, they're a little bit depressing. Um, maybe they were intended to be because, you know, Roger's pointing out all the, the problems of human nature and greed and all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, a, a, a track like Breathe, Breathe in the Air, Don't Be Afraid to Care, is sort of almost unthinkable without the music behind it. And so that's why I think the success of this album is truly a combination of the four talents within the band. And I think that the lyrics work well as lines on their own, but not without the music, they kind of lose something. Um, anyway, so what else have we got to say? On Great Gig in the Sky, the was solo track written by Richard Wright, um, with the lovely chord sequence. So Claire Torrey was asked to come in and sing that memorable vocal 
and apparently she, she got a bit emotional and lost it a bit and sort of went over the top and was a bit embarrassed by her performance. But the bands were in the control room secretly in admiration of her and they loved it, or even, although they didn't tell her at the time. So she left the studio thinking she'd gone over the top. And then suddenly when she got into the record shop and looked at the sleeve and saw her name on the credits, she realized she was on the album. And in later years, she would, I would think quite rightly, um, sue Pink Floyd for, for co-songwriting royalties, saying, you know, my contribution is, is worthy of a, of a songwriting credit. And they settled out of court. I don't know how much she got, but I think she deserved it. And, and also she was taken on tour by the band in the, to tour with this album on a lot of the gigs in 1974, at least. Um, so that was... A very important contribution hers, I think, to that song. But the, the actual chord sequence is Rick, Richard Wright's. Um, so the, you know, when Roger Waters says in in uh, interviews, "I wrote this album. It's it's my work. Let, let's have less of the talk of we." Well, it's true that he wrote the lyrics, but it's uh, you know with that song he had absolutely nothing to do with it, and um, I don't think he had much to do with some of the music on some of the other tracks. So. I know lyrics are important, but I think music is also central to the Pink Floyd sound. In fact, the Gilmore guitar sound is probably the, the most distinctive sound if you, if you ask the man in the street. So also on this album is Doris Troy, um, who was on the Apple label for a while. Um, she's turned up on various records, so she was playing, ba singing backing vocals. And I was reading an interview with Rick Wright saying it was the first time that they'd had I think it was the first time they'd had female backing vocalists uh, on a Pink Floyd album, which made it sound a little bit more commercial. Because um, if you if you look at the if you listen to the album, quite a bit of it is experimental, and you think, well, how did this album sell? Because it's um, it's not very commercial. It's of long passages of instrumental work, but uh, it was so good. The songs when they when they when it came to the songs and, and the lyrics were so good, um, it could hardly fail. It just took off in one of those ways that it's it's hard to explain exactly why. But uh, the band were all very pleased that it took off. But they felt once they'd achieved this album, then you know what else is there left to to achieve? And Roger, in particular, got a bit disillusioned with the business. And even even in Wish You Were Here, he was saying, "Well, we've done it all," you know. And they struggled to lay down tracks for that album for several months before it came together. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, and then they did keep going for a few more years, but as we know, Roger kind of took over artistically a bit um, too, too much for the other's liking. Um, so we've got to the tracks. We've got, well, I've already talked about um, Breathe. That, that's a superb track, great chord changes. And they did that when they reunited on stage for the, uh, the Live 8 thing in 2005, was it, I think? Um, or 2008, one of those two. Uh, Money is a good track, and I love the cash register kind of little loop at the beginning. Superb way to start a track called Money. Um, but uh, the, the lyrics I have a bit of a problem with, in the same way that All You Need Is Love is a bit simplistic about All You Need Is Love, to sing that uh, money, so they say, is the root of all evil today. I'm not quite sure what Roger imagines the alternative is, you know, going back to cavemen days without money. Um, he still had human greed uh, back then, and I think greed is probably the root of all evil today rather than money. So money is just a, a means to an end, as it were, sort of a way of keeping society going. And the Romans, I think, were the first to introduce it, or one of the first um, people to introduce it. And I, th I think it's a, it's a... Anyway, I'm going on a bit, but you know what I mean. I think I don't think it's the all root root of all evil. Um, Us and them is just sublime, absolutely brilliant melody, brilliant sax playing. Um, this is brilliantly engineered. This album produced by the band, but I think Alan Parsons is involved in the engineering, and Peter Jones is assisting, and also Chris Thomas was brought in fresh pair of ears for the mixing of the album and came up with a few suggestions and uh, there was a debate about whether to have echo, too much echo or not enough echo and but I think most for the most part the band agreed on on most artistic decisions for this album so I was interested to read that 
while they were making this album, because they were getting on so well, they would occasionally stop and watch Monty Python's Flying Circus together, which you cannot imagine them doing today, can you, those of the, who are still alive, that is. And I thought it was interesting in the last song, um, Eclipse, sorry, it's uh, in Brain Damage, the last line of Brain Damage, and if the band you're in starts playing different tunes, I'll see you on the dark side of the moon, which actually doesn't make much sense as a, as a couplet, but I thought it was an interesting line because a few years later the, the band did start playing different tunes and in terms of going in different directions and pulling each other apart and I thought that was interesting. Uh, Nick Mason writes the first song, Speak to Me, and there's all kind of spoken um, contributions from various people, including Henry McCulloch and J James Griffiths managed to find the source of that story in a book on McCartney recently. Um, it was a Jim, Jim McCartney, Paul's dad, New Year's Eve party in the Wirral, uh, where Henry McCulloch got a bit drunk and had an altercation with his wife. And so when, when he was asked for, the, for this album, because the question is, when were you last violent? And Henry said, well, I was quite drunk at the time. Uh, not very good Irish accent, sorry. Um, anyway, so that, that was um, that little story. That was interesting. And then Time is a track I haven't talked about, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Dave Gilmore sings it very passionately, as if it's his own, really, and then does a wonderful guitar solo. And then Brain Damage and Eclipse, wonderful ways to finish off the album. So a tour de force effort. I wouldn't say it's my favourite, but it's certainly an album which one should revisit every now and then and just remind oneself how brilliant it is. And uh, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.